after the breakdown of the regime, you still need lawyers, you still need doctors, you still need mayors, you still need engineers. But most of these elites are implicated in some way or form, otherwise they wouldn't be elites. So what do you do? You kind of need these people. But at the same time, how can these people represent this new state with that kind of history? I'm interested in how ordinary citizens lived. Um, and since I'm a historian of modern Germany, so, so 19th and 20th century, uh, I'm particularly interested in these big uh, caesuras in German history, right? So 1945, the end of World War II, the total collapse of a regime that promised to exist for a thousand years and lived exactly 12. And how do people deal with this? And how should we today? deal with uh, the defeat, the acknowledgement of genocide being perpetrated, the complicity of ordinary people in the Holocaust. But I'm also interested in the uh, caesura of 1989, right, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of a state that conveyed to its citizens that it was permanent. So how do we deal with these kind of caesuras and what does that mean for ordinary people? My upbringing was always steeped in, in history. In my parents' living room, they had this wonderful library and all the important books of the 70s and 80s were there. But we also had this basement where all the books from my uh, grandparents were, and they were all the Nazi books. My parents did not throw these books away, but clearly they were not Nazi. And yet in the basement, there were all these books. So of course I went down to read, but I'm grateful that my parents didn't throw this out. They clearly lived different ideals, but there was also a, a very strong sense that we are part of a larger history if we want it or not. And that ordinary people live through that history and make choices in many ways pretty bad choices. So in my family, clearly they were accomplices to the regime. There is no glorious story of, of resistance whatsoever. But history was literally lurking in the basement. So identities in, are informed by, by many uh, different things. I'm a father, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, I'm a German, I'm an American, I'm, I'm lots of things. But these ruptures in history challenge that. So what does it mean to be German in 1945, when everything that you thought Germanness would entail, heavily informed by, by Nazi ideologies, have just been proven utterly wrong? So how, how do you revert back to something that is useful to you. I'm particularly interested in family history. My grandfather, I have his denazification papers, and among them there's also a letter that he solicited from a lawyer friend saying how he helped Jews and how he wasn't really a Nazi. But I know he was a Nazi, he was a member of the party, and I've seen his party records. But he worked for the city administration and he wanted to keep his job, so all of a sudden all the kind of ties he had to Jews uh, before 1933, those were of course all of a sudden very important. And so they inform this kind of letter that's washing him clean. But the same stories were irrelevant before or had to be hidden. New parts of his identity become important now that he lives in a different regime. And this is what I'm studying, how apologetic narratives emerge that explain why ordinary Germans failed and how they then redeem themselves as the nation itself has redeemed itself. So I think uh, studying history makes us aware of that we in our small existence are part of something much larger over the course of generations. I'm reminded of that by uh, looking at this prayer book that's uh, in, it's from 1688, but it's in my family um, since then. And it records birth, marriages, death, it makes me aware that I'm part of something that is much bigger and that, you know, the trials and tribulations of my life are, right, I mean, I'm not uh, so vastly different from the trials and tribulations that these people at some point met in their lives.